Hello, welcome to Hope Church Harrogate's message of the week. If you'd like to connect with us, please head over to hopeharrogate.co.uk forward slash connect. We'd love to hear from you. Um, Dan's going to come preach in a moment, um, but as we have been doing beforehand, we are reading out the verses that we're going to be looking at this morning. Um, If you want to bring up your Bible, if you are like me and you can't read that, small print, uh, and you've got your on your phone or on your Bible, please feel free to bring it up if you want. I'm going to read it um, so we're taking in it together. So it's 1 Corinthians 6 verses 1 to half of 9. So if any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Can you hear me? Great. Good morning. My name's Dan, and I'm continuing our series in 1 Corinthians. Um, This is a series on how the church is called to be distinct from the world around it. And it is really evident in this passage, isn't it, how the church was supposed to be different. They were going to people outside the church to make judgments on what is right and wrong for them, quite clearly not fulfilling that calling to be different. Um, This particular week, the, the title is Mercy Triumphs When It Loses. Um, Yeah, interesting. Um, And we are just talking about what the vision of justice and mercy is that Paul is painting for us today. So this is really part two of the talk from last week. Rachel was talking about a man who was sleeping with his mother-in-law, and nobody in the church was holding them to account for this. And um, a little summary that I've put together, you can kind of agree whether or not you think this is right, is that when... um, Thanks. When the church abdicates its responsibility to hold one another to account, everybody loses. Is that a fair reflection of what Rachel said last week? So there is this kind of vacuum of accountability in the church. And in one respect, we see what happens when there is no accountability. But today is really when people inside the church go looking for accountability outside of the church because they it's, it's a human kind of need to hold people to account for what is wrong. When it's not happening here in the church, then they'll go look for it elsewhere. Um, and the scenario that you might be able to kind of piece together is that maybe two of the more wealthy people in the church, people that have property, have possessions, have got in some kind of business conflict, and they are um, suing one another. And likely that if they're the wealthy people in the church, then maybe it's one of the people that even owns the building where they meet. They might both be leaders within the church. And so I'm sure many people in this room have got stories of when leaders in the church have a very public dispute and people take sides. It gets nasty very quickly and entire churches can kind of become two divided groups in these sort of situations. Or it might well be that there is some sort of imbalance of power, that one person who has all the power is suing the person who doesn't have the power. And again, we can see how very quickly that could tear a church apart. Um, I sometimes find that when you read through one of these passages quite quickly, 
it can be hard to follow exactly what Paul's arguments are. So I've spent some time on it, and I'm going to summarize it for you in, in other words. So I have three bullet points. Number one, Paul says it is theologically absurd, really. He uses this phrase, do you not know that we will judge angels? You may have not known that, actually, because it's not something we talk about very often in churches. But in the Jewish heritage, it would have been something that was quite well known. It comes from the book of Daniel. Um, and he's saying, well, when the next age comes, when this time has passed, Jesus has returned and, and there's a new kingdom established, then we're going to be judging with God. He's going to allow us to rule and reign with him. We will judge all of his creation with him including the angels. If we're going to judge them, you're going to just, whoever happens to be in the marketplace this day, to judge you. That is theologically bizarre. It is also morally confused because the standard of kind of, the standard of living, the standard of righteousness that we are called to is vastly different to that of the world. There's a very different standard at play and in our context, where our legal system is kind of a post-Christian society, where our rules and regulations have been built on the teachings of Jesus, really, we don't see that difference as much, but, but we still do. In that context, it would have been even more kind of obvious that this was just a really strange thing to do. Um, if you remember back in chapter 4, Paul said something like, um, he was being really sarcastic with them. He, I like to read it in his tone. He says, oh, we are so weak, but you are so strong. You know, we are, we are fools for Christ, but you are so wise. Um, this, today, um, I read it in this. Is it possible there is nobody among you wise enough to judge the cases of those in the church? He is really um, hammering at their self-worth, that they have built themselves up to be so wise, and yet... They won't take on the responsibility for making judgments among them. And objectively misaligned. So they are going for the wrong objective. What they are seeking by going to these courts outside the church is they're seeking what I'm going to call justice. And justice, we, we think of it as a good thing. We'd rather have justice than injustice, wouldn't we? But justice here represents punishment for the person who's done wrong. It represents retribution. It represents vengeance. And um, humans are kind of famously bad at dishing out justice. Um, it's all over the Bible. It's not hard to find stories of where humans get justice wrong. But even in the news this week, you, um, if you've read about um, Trump's jury, they're trying to find 12 people who can be impartial about Donald Trump, and they just can't find anyone. Everyone acknowledges I cannot be impartial in this case. I have strong opinions, and that's going to sway how I think. I cannot make an impartial judgment. Instead, Paul argues we should be seeking mercy, which makes things right through restoration and through righteousness, which means having right relationships with people around us and with God. It's all about trying to put things right by restoring relationship rather than punishing the person who's done wrong. And the consequences of getting this wrong, in case you missed it at the end, is that the, the unrighteous do not inherit the kingdom of God. That is to say that the people who live like this aren't actually Christians. They are not people who will rule and reign with God and inherit the kingdom. So it's quite important that we understand what this means for us. So some of the pitfalls that we can apply this badly, we've got a picture, um, is that it can feel like we're calling people to be a doormat. We're calling people to say, it's okay, you do whatever you want to me, and I will let you do that. And that's not what Paul is saying, you'll be glad to know. We do not condone immoral behavior. When he says, why not rather be wronged, it's not saying, just let people do whatever they want to you. 
Because if we can apply this to ourselves and we can say, okay, so I'm called to let people do whatever I want. But when you start applying that to the person next to you and say, no, no, you have to let, let that person do whatever they want to you. You have to let them do that. What we start doing is condoning immoral and unhealthy behavior. And we start um, permitting abusive behavior within our churches, which obviously isn't what Jesus is calling us to. It's not a license to cover up unhealthy or even criminal behavior and deal with it internally. That's not what Paul is saying. Uh, you can see how you could get there, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not right. We do not require victims of unhealthy or abusive behavior to forgive and forget the consequences of sin. If you want more wisdom in this area of how we handle people who refuse to listen to correction, go back and listen to Rachel's talk last week. It was excellent. But I want to talk about a better way that we can confront one another with um, when we see things that need to be addressed within the church. So if there are two parties that have some sort of conflict, then as people in the church, we should not be afraid to just address one another and say, I've noticed you're doing this. It's not okay. If you can't find a way to meet on that, if you say, no, I disagree, I think you've done me wrong, bring in a third party. Might be one person, might be a, a small group of two or three people. But this doesn't need to be. Let's all as a church all air our grievances with one another and decide who's in the wrong. But to add wisdom and impartiality into a disagreement is a really healthy thing. Um, yeah, so talking about suing one another, Jesus actually talked about a situation where um, if someone sues you for your tunic, give him your coat also. You might recognize that from the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' wisdom for what happens when people sue one another. And I'm going to take something that I heard in the Bible Project very recently. I know there are a number of fans in the room, so you'll, you'll have heard it as well. Um, but this, this idea of suing for someone for their tunic, there were protections in the law in the Old Testament that if someone sued you for your coat and you would give them your coat as a promise of payment later on, they had to return it to you overnight to make sure that you didn't freeze to death in the meantime, and then that would be your guarantee of payment. But it seems that there was this some practice that Jesus was talking about where people were saying, okay, I won't sue you for your outer coat, I'll so sue you for your undergarment, and then, then I haven't violated the law, have I? And Jesus says, this is the way to respond to someone who is acting like that. Give them your tunic, and also give them your coat. And you can see that scenario playing out where standing in the marketplace, in the middle of a busy town, you're standing half naked, and this person who is suing you is there holding your clothes. And that picture of Injustice is just on display for the whole world to see. And that is responding with mercy rather than seeking justice. It's about being more generous just to highlight something that has gone wrong. It's about creating maybe more creative ways of responding to problems than just trying to get even. Because mistrust and contempt and hatred, if you respond with mistrust, contempt, and hatred, only increases the hatred, whereas only light can drive out darkness. Responding with bold and radical love is the way to defeat hatred. Inside the church, hopefully, we don't need to be as radical as that with one another. It should be easier to find justice with people who are all calling themselves Jesus followers. Something like this might be a really healthy way to resolve. You say, my friend, I believe you've done me wrong. And I forgive you for that. You may not see it in the same way that I do, but I hope that you're going to spend some time, reflect on that, and we can continue to be friends. Perhaps, maybe, if you're doing business outside of church together, 
you don't need to continue to be business partners. That's okay. If you can find a way to move forward as people who still value one another as individuals with dignity, as images of God, then that's, that's the goal. That is mercy, that is righteousness, which is far better than justice. If you want to find a few other stories in the Bible that talk about this, we could look at David and Saul. When Saul is looking for David to try and kill him, and he takes, um, he relieves himself, shall we say, in a cave where it turns out that David is hiding. And David sneaks up with his sword, and he has the full opportunity to kill him while he's vulnerable. But he just cuts off the corner of his coat. And as Saul goes away, David comes out and he says, look, I could have had you, but justice is for God. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. It's not mine to take justice. Or you could look at the story of Zacchaeus, who when Jesus meets with him, Jesus doesn't say, look, you've done wrong. What you need to do is you have to make it right and you have to pay back this. Jesus meets him with love and kindness and acceptance. And Zacchaeus, convicted of his own wrongdoing, decides, oh, I need to make this right, actually. And in seeking right relationship, chooses to give back four times what he's cheated. That is a response of the heart, which may involve some repayment, reparations, but it is not about trying to get even and seeking justice. And on what authority do I say <laughs> that this is a better way to do it than to deal with things internally and be a doormat? Well, it's, it's looking at Jesus, of course, because humanity had all wronged God in more ways than we can count. And where God could have inflicted justice by killing us all would have been his right. Instead, he chose to take on humanity and come to earth as a person, confront the sin of man, not by pointing it out and telling they're all wrong and defeating them, but by subjecting himself to them to be killed on the cross. This is mercy. It's not about justice. God will have justice in the end, but what we're called to is to seek mercy and righteousness? How can we be creative in ways that restore relationship without trying to get even? I'm going to ask Rob and the band to come back up and lead us in one more song in just a minute. But um, how I'd like us to respond is to feel challenged and to work out are there ways that I would love to get even, but how can I creatively, creatively show mercy and generosity? But what we long for is not the wisdom to do this right. That is a short-term fix. What we long for is a day when this is no longer a problem, where there are no longer injustices which have to be put right. What we long for is the day when Jesus will put everything right in the way that only he can. So we're going to sing about that there will be a day when all will bow before him. That's the day that we look forward to. Um, so let's just lift our eyes back to Jesus. Let's allow him to work in our hearts. Let's allow him to highlight areas where maybe we've been seeking justice rather than mercy. Um, and let's anticipate that day with excitement when, when he will come again and all we put right.